Okay, well, good morning and thanks for coming. So I'm going to cover, Eric covered a little bit about the workup. I'm going to go a little bit more at it from a clinician standpoint and then also how I manage these patients. Um, it's we're going to focus mostly on the tibia, but a lot of this applies to any lower extremity stress fractures other than the high risk ones that we'll talk about at the end. So, so I have no disclosures. So the things I really want to cover are like how common are these stress fractures of the lower leg? Um, what might contribute to the incidence of stress fractures in the athletes that we take care of? And then what are our treatment options? So the, you know, the first of all is the issue of um, how many injuries we deal with in this population. You know, high school, even now we're middle school kids. And if you look at the data that's been, pub that's been published, the number of childhood injuries is really skyrocketing as the years have gone on. Um, we're seeing you know, three and a half million children under the age of, treat, of 14 are treated annually for sports injuries. That's a lot of very young kids. Of the, over, of the high school and middle school injuries we see, half of the injuries are overuse injuries. And in high school athletics, we have 500,000 doctor visits and 30,000 hospitalizations for um, injuries that occur in school. And I think what we see is that all the things that we know about kids uh, specializing in sports earlier, participating in school sports, but doing strength and conditioning after they're done with practice. I mean, they are just spending a lot of time on sports, and then we're seeing the, the problems with that. There's been some really good look at the overuse injuries that we're dealing with. This is a great uh, large study that's happening up out of Boston, the Growing Up Today study. So this is a prospective study looking at girls as they enter into sports and then and following them in a linear fashion. So over almost 7,000 girls between 9 and 15 years old, almost 4% developed stress fractures during the time of this study. The most common sports being running, cheerleading, gymnastics, and basketball. And some of the findings that they're starting to report, and there'll be even more data coming out, you know, increased age at Menarch, a family history of osteoporosis, so there's probably some indication that there's an underlying uh, problem with the bone, you know, maybe from a metabolic standpoint or from a nutritional standpoint. I think all that data will be culled out as time goes on in the future. Um, here's another study looking at high school stress fractures between from 2005 to 2013, a 1.5% rate at per 100,000 athlete exposures. Again, the distance runners having the most gymnastics also very common. Girls, twice, more, twice as more uh, injuries as boys in terms of stress fractures. Luckily, 99% of them are managed non-surgically, but in the majority of cases, at least three weeks off of sports. So Eric pointed out a little bit about his stress fracture, stress fracture registry data. This was really interesting and eye-opening because he did recruit a lot of you that are probably in the room and people from around the country. Um, and it was an online database that was quick and easy to fill out. And in the matter of time, two and a half years, we got uh, 263 stress fractures contributed to the database. Once again, the female rate is higher than the males. If we look at the age, the females started, had their stress fractures at a little bit younger age. This was the high school population. One of the you know, things that, again, it's sometimes you just need the data to point out what we know. You know. First time out for sports. So the girls that go out for their first time, go out for the track team or the basketball team, and as a freshman or as a sophomore, that's when they're getting their injuries. And then as they go through sports and kind of hang in there, Maybe they learn how to manage their body, but they you start to see a lower incidence with increased age. Males, a little bit older, but again, 10th and 11th grade when they're really starting to get into sports. And that, for me, that's an important thing because I don't want to see these injuries result in the kids giving up on sports. We know what the problem is with childhood obesity. So as much as high school sports is there for competition, it's also there to develop a healthy lifestyle. And I think that's one of the most important things we can offer to our, our student athletes. So some of the interesting findings, you know, again, the, 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 Eric pointed out the number six as a, as a good mark of um, a pain scale that's a significant number. So you have seen this, the scores were in the range of 6.6, 7.2 for girls. So these were confirmed stress fractures. Track, still the most common, 65% were in the tibia. But surprisingly, a good number of them were in stop and, sp stop and start sports. So basketballs, cutting, and things also cause that. But I think what's happening is in these sports that are on the field, there's a lot more uh, conditioning going on, so more running that's probably leading to some of the stress injuries. Tibia, the most common. Um, 
almost 20% had had a prior stress fracture. So what's the greatest risk for a stress fracture? A prior stress fracture. And again, this data just points that out. Um, other things that Eric already talked about I won't cover again. So. so the things to keep in mind is that we are dealing with adolescent bones. Um, different than an adult bone, there's less mineralization, right? You, mineral, you are laying down the mineral in your bone until you're around 22 years old or so. So the bone probably isn't as strong. It is a little bit more flexible. There's still axial growth going on. So these are things to think about as, we're, uh, as these athletes are pushing themselves harder than we've probably seen student athletes push themselves in the past. And this was another, I was actually one of the, on this uh, founding board of Stop Sports Injuries. And this really was a, a culmination of, a, of all the injuries that we're seeing. So this was members of AOSSM, NATA, uh, the Pediatric Society, AMSSM, and basically when we sat down for the first discussion of stop sports injuries, everybody in the room said what we we're seeing is kids working too hard. We're seeing way too many overuse injuries. This wasn't a, a thing to talk about how do we decrease ACL injuries or shoulder dislocations. The majority of the time was spent on how do we decrease the incidence of stress fractures and overuse injuries in our kids. So these were leaders in the field of sports medicine who recognized that they were just literally calling the stress fracture and overuse injuries an epidemic in our, in our nation's kids. So, you know, going to more clinical picture, this is, you know, typically what I'll see around the third week of September, you know, a 14 year old girl who comes in, she's a ninth grader, has gone out for cross country, and uh, she, her shin is starting to hurt for about two weeks. You know, she's, it's worse after running, it's starting to get progressively worse, but she can walk around school without any pain. Uh, when I examine her, she's tender to palpation, postromedial tibia, usually the junction of the middle distal thirds, what I find, no swelling, no ecchymosis. It's pretty routine, and, uh, you know, they're, but, She's concerned, parents are concerned, and trainers concerned. So the question is, what do I do with a girl like this who's a ninth grader? Do I tell her to stop running? You know, that's, that's the easiest answer. Do you stop running? Um, and maybe they've gone to their pediatrician. Maybe they've gone to an urgent care. And again, that tends to be the easy answer is just stop, you know, take six weeks off. If you tell this ninth grader to take six weeks off, She's probably never going to run again. You know, she'd probably lose interest and think it's not worth it. And is that the right message to send to that young girl? That's, I, I really don't think it is. If you tell her to take some time off, how long? Again, I've had more than enough kids just come and say, well, take, I, my pediatrician said take six weeks off. And I, I, you'll, as you'll see, I try not to ever go there at all. I don't necessarily think that they have to stop running at all in this particular case. Do I get an x-ray? I'm an orthopedic surgeon, the parents are here, I have an x-ray machine in the office, I'm probably getting an x-ray. Do I need an x-ray? You know, probably not in most of these cases. In this particular clinical scenario where she's only had pain for two weeks, do I really think she has a, a visible stress fracture on x-ray? Probably not, but there are some of the physical exam findings like Eric talked about, like the, and I'll talk about those, that kind of make me lean more towards getting one than not. And then obviously, do I need an MRI? At this stage of the game, I don't need an MRI, but it's something I'm gonna start thinking about based on the particular patient. I, try, I do try to individualize each case that I see. So I look at this, I try to really do a thorough history on these patients. I ask them how long have they had the pain in their shins, and I do ask them about the pain score, because we found through our own work that you know, if you get up over the number six, you really need to be concerned that they have a, a true stress reaction in the bone. Um, when do you have the pain? I, one of the more important things is, are you starting to have pain walking around? Just say, do you have pain walking around school? Or for the, you know, the kids, I say, how about when you go to walk around the mall all day on Saturday? You know, do you have pain in your shin? Because if that's starting to affect them with routine daily activities, need to be concerned. You know, do you notice any limp? I ask the parents, do you, do you see your child limping around the house? Um, you know, obviously the question's about changes in training regimen. In this particular case, this is the girl who's never run before, but wants to go out for a team and goes out for the cross country team. So of course it's a change. She went from not running to running five or six days or seven days a week. Um, how many hours a week? Um, I do ask about their dairy intake because I'm trying to get an idea of their general nutritional status. And uh, so ask about milk because that helps with vitamin D and calcium. If it's a, someone who's a little bit older, I'll ask if they had a prior stress fracture. For the, I do try to discuss menstrual dysfunction depending on their age and talk a little bit about diet. So for me, like I know, I, 
I don't have a ton of time to spend with them, so I kind of move the things that I find the most important is I palpate. If they have diffuse tenderness up and down the entire tibia, I'm not as concerned as if I find an area of point tenderness. Again, if I have a positive fulcrum test, you know, I get more concerned. And I, I really put a lot of emphasis on the single leg hop. If somebody can hop up and down and they look normal, odds are it's not that bad. But the subtle findings that Eric talked about, the kind of the increased landing time and, uh, and slower takeoff, if they look dysfunctional, then, I'm, then I get a little bit more worried. Again, in my office, I do get x-rays. And you know, what does the data show us? That the x-rays are positive probably less than one third of the time. But it's probably worthwhile if they, if they come back a second time and they're not getting better and we get an x-ray the second time around, now we have an increased pickup of positive findings. And again, that's what the data showed us. But usually we'll just see, I get an AP and a lateral view and I don't see much going on. But I've had cases, and this is an example of what, you're, what I specifically look for. I look for that injury on the posterior medial cortex of the tibia, you know, thickening of a periosteal reaction or thickening of the cortex or some change in the bone. Once you see that, that's actually a higher grade stress injury. Once it shows up on x-ray and there's radiographic findings, you're looking at a grade three or a grade four stress reaction of the tibia. There's no fracture line there, but obviously the bone is going through a process that's causing some remodeling at that site. So what do I do for, for this particular girl? She has mild findings, she has a negative x-ray, short duration of pain. Um, I really just talk to her about activity modification. I explain the whole process. Like I have this kind of pat talk that I say to kids all the time. I say, look, when you go out running and jumping, you cause microscopic cracks in your bone. When you go to bed at night, your body heals them. That's the way our body works. You don't know it, your body doesn't know it, and it's all good. Sometimes, and it's usually increased intensity or duration of your workouts, you start causing more cracks in your bone than your body heals. So now it hurts at the end of practice, but you want to keep running. Now it hurts in the middle of practice, and before you know it, it hurts at school. And that seems to sink into the kids and the parents. It's like you can't go from zero to 60 overnight, which is what we see with a lot of our younger athletes. But I, again, what I try to emphasize to them is you can make it through this. You don't have to stop running. Maybe only run half of the practices, right? In the ideal world, I know the coaches are overwhelmed with kids, right? The track teams are usually really big. And it would be great if they had an A team and a B team. And the A team are the kids who have run before, and the B team are the new, the new people. And they could kind of taper them up. But they don't have the time for that. They don't have the staff for that. But so I can you know, kind of send this message back. And a lot of the coaches, the trainers, seem to be willing to, to kind of go that route. But you know, pool running is an option if that's available. Um, so are non-impact aerobic training. Spend time on the elliptical, or on the exercise bike, or on a Nordic Trek skier. You know, obviously, at, you know some of the bigger schools you have things like uh, Alter G uh, uh, treadmills and things like that. But there's a way to decrease the loads on the tibia and still keep the kids interested in running. And when I tell them if they're good enough to compete on the team, they're you know running in races run the races like it's okay you're not nothing bad's going to happen you may not be able to train as hard and then as you start to improve you start to do as you start to get better you can train harder and spend longer time in practice but i try to emphasize almost like a six if as a ballpark figure i say if you think about using a six week ramp up you're probably going to be okay and we get through most of them and the most important message i send to the kids as they walk out the door is don't give up like don't give up on track don't give up on lacrosse Hang in there. You'll get through this, and then you'll be okay. By the time you're a junior or senior, you won't get these injuries anymore. You'll be giving advice to the underclassmen who are getting the injuries. So hopefully I send that message out uh, well to the kids. So as far as advanced imaging is concerned, in a case like this, I'm really not going to use it um, because I, I, clinically I'm pretty sure about my diagnosis. The x-rays tell me that I don't have an advanced stage stress injury. And you know, there's some data out there to show that if we do move on to the, uh, the advanced imaging that we have very high sensitivities, both MRI and bone scan. I tend to use MRI and, more, and almost bone scan never because MRI doesn't involve radiation and bone scan does. But the nice thing about MRI is that there is a grading uh, system that we use. And I think the grading system is going to prove to be helpful as we deal with athletes that have a higher, that are higher levels of competition where we're more concerned how hard can person and um, how long will it take them to get back. 
So the Friedrich system is the, the Friedrichsen grading system is the most commonly used. It's been modified a little bit over the years, but essentially what I like to look at are these low grade or high grade stress reactions of the tibia. So here's examples on the left is what I would, was what's referred to as a grade one stress reaction. So the only thing you really see is periosteal edema. Sometimes you have to look carefully, but in, I probably admit that sometimes imagination and find some edema that may not really be there. But you know, if the clinically you see that edema at the site of pain, it's, it's a helpful finding. It can be helpful even for the coaches. Like if a kid comes in and says, I'm struggling and uh, get it, and it comes back positive, we show it the positive MRI findings. Now everyone kind of believes it a little bit more than if I say, well, the doctor said I have one, but there's no MRI. So you know, we end up using that to help prove that we are dealing with a stress reaction of the bone. Grade two is more marrow edema. You can see that where the yellow arrow is. Grade three tends to be on both sides, periosteal and marrow edema, and that's the more severe stages. And in grade four, there's an actual fracture line breaking through the cortex. You may or may not see that fracture line on plain x-ray. What you might only see is the periosteal reaction. If you see a fracture line, obviously they've gotten to a, a very advanced stage. And I've seen that a few times over the years. So we spend a lot of money on these MRIs to do them, but you know, what, what's the uh, benefit of that? Well, here's a nice study by Liz Arendt that showed that the return to time to sport actually did correlate with the grade, grading of the MRI system. So again, if you're dealing with an athlete, how long do I have to be out? The, the lower the grade, the shorter the time to return to full participation in sports. But you can see that once you hit grade four, you're looking at you know, three or four months of time out of sports before you're back playing again without restriction. So my, sorry, my mic's in and out. Um, same thing, here's another one, correlating the MRI grading with the return to play, and once again, showing that you know, MRI grade is an independent predictor of recovery time. So in other words, the lower the grade, the faster the time return to sports, the higher the grade, the longer return. They also interestingly found that they did DEXA scans on these patients, and the patients that had the longer return to sport had lower bone mineral densities. We'll talk a little bit about that going forward. So I do think that bone mineral density is an issue, especially in our female athletes, but probably also our, our males. Um, this was a good study that showed that looked at the bone density as an as an etiologic fracture uh, factor for stress fractures. So this is 25 uh, athletes with stress fractures and 25 athletes without. And we found that compared to the controls, the injured athletes had a lower DEXA scan, a greater likelihood of menstrual irregularity. They did have similar um, caloric intake, but the injured patients had lower calcium intake, so diet being something that we need to talk about. So I use these stress injuries in these kids to talk a little bit about their diet, and some, some of the data shows us that low calcium and low vitamin D intake is a, is a risk factor for um, stress injuries, and I think we're, I mean, it seems like in this day and age, vitamin D is the cure-all for everything. But it certainly makes sense because vitamin D is a very important part of the metabolic uh, process of bone development. So another study by Farriker showed that 56% you know, of athletes with stress injuries had inadequate uh, vitamin D intake and vitamin D levels. And this was a study looking at, a lot of this has been done in the Israeli military, but this was a Navy study where they showed that by uh, putting recruits on 2,000 milligrams of calcium and 800 units of vitamin D. And 800 is pretty low. Currently, we're usually recommended 1,000. I usually recommend 2,000 units of vitamin D. Um, by, by putting them on this nutritional supplementation at the beginning of basic training, they're able to lower the incidence of stress fractures in the, uh, in the treated group. Um, so the long-term implications, you know, I think the other thing I talk about, especially you know, when the mom's in the room with a girl, but you know, we don't worry as much about it with boys because you don't talk about osteoporosis with boys, is you know, females, we all lay down our bone mineralization until we're about 22 and then we stop. So if the girls, like for instance, gymnasts who are amenorrheic or distance runners who are you know, not having their menstrual cycles, they, you know, we have to worry about the female athlete triad syndrome and things like that. But you know, if they start off with a low bone density as a young person, it's going to catch up with them later in life. So their risk of osteoporosis as an adult female goes up and then all the sequelae of osteoporosis, risk of hip fractures and proximal humerus fractures and things that can have an effect on your overall health. So there, we're starting to move in a direction where, I, and I think we're going to be doing this with our DEXA scanners, we're going to start looking into doing bone densities on the athletes that have more than one stress fracture because it is a concern um, about, about their future bone health. 
So as far as you know, going into treatment, I want to you know, run through this again because I think it's important. If I have a, um, a patient who comes in, I've gotten an x-ray, it's negative. We send them for an MRI because they're not getting better. It's still positive, but it's not a grade four. I'm still going to tell them that we can keep them running or competing, but we're going to have to seriously modify their activity level. So depending on the modalities that, or the, uh, the exercise modalities we have, pools, alter Gs, whatever the case may be, we're going to try to keep them aerobically fit but decrease the amount of impact loading they do on the bone. We're going to try to you know, maybe focus on competition only um, if that's the only time that they run. But the line that I basically tell them is we're going to modify your activities to the point where in the worst case scenario, you're not, you're not getting any worse. You're staying the same. If we can get them through the season that way, that's okay. But in the ideal world, we've modified their activities to the point where they're getting a little bit better with each passing week. It doesn't have to be a lot, just a little bit better. But the one thing that can happen is they can't get worse. We tell them if they're getting worse, then you have to stop, right? And that's, it's pretty straightforward. But what does that require? It requires honest communication between the athlete and the trainers. They have to check in regularly, monitor their symptoms, and see how they're doing. Because, you know, we know that these, a lot of the kids we're dealing with are going to push hard and they're going to push through the pain to the point where then they get to a high-grade stress injury and then they're out for a particularly long period of time. But if I have a grade 4 stress injury, they're definitely going on rest. If I see a fracture line on MRI or on x-ray, now I'm telling them, do they need to walk around campus on crutches? Maybe, maybe not. Let's try just stopping altogether and just walk. Does the pain get better in one week? then we can probably let you walk this off. But if they come back a week later and they're still having significant pain, we should probably be putting those on crutches because that level of activity modification hasn't led to a significant enough improvement in their symptoms. Um, what can we do? Again, you know, some at the college level, it's like, well, what, what else can we do to make this heal faster? Bottom line is there's nothing. I wish there was. You know, so we spend money on the pulsed ultrasound units, pulsed electromagnetic field, there's all kinds of data that shows that, you know, in randomized, blinded, prospective studies, those modalities don't work with stress fractures. We still put them on. I'm putting them on someone this week because he's got a stress fracture and wants to get it better and wants to try everything. So we'll put on a pulsed ultrasound, and if it gets better, he'll say that it helped. But the data, the science shows us that it doesn't. There was some talk about calcitonin spray and nasal spray in increasing the... Uh, healing rate of stress fractures, but again, in a good randomized prospective study, no benefit. So there's no good data to support their use, but the bottom line is we still use it anyway because of external pressures that may not be based on science. So I think the shin pain scoring system that Eric talked about is really interesting because we see so much of this. The question is, can we, by history and physical exam alone, predict the, uh, the level of a stress reaction that we're dealing with, and that may help us counsel patients on how much time do they take off? How aggressive do we have to be in taking them out of sports? Or how aggressive can we be in letting them continue to play without you know, going through a, a gigantic diagnostic workup? And we, has up to 75, we have 75 subjects, 150 shins, 130 of them were symptomatic. So in this group of patients, 83% of the patients had a positive MRI. And you can see that the grade, we, although half of them were grade two, there's a good number of grade three, and we've picked up even three more grade four stress reactions over the last four weeks. 70% um, of them had bilateral findings. So in the patients that have participated in this study, we're seeing a high incidence of positive MRI findings. Um, these are just some interesting findings, so we haven't called through all the data yet. But um, this, Eric took the patients that came in early in the study and has followed them longitudinally. And what we're seeing is that you know, half of them were out for more than eight weeks because of their shin pain. Um, almost uh, more than a third of them had, more sh had continued shin pain as at, st at the six month mark. Um, and then 75%, six months later, still had more shin pain. And so essentially what we're seeing is, even though we, once we get them with a positive MRI, we've counseled them on activity modification, they're still not fully recovered six months after the injury. So it is a nagging injury that tends to not go away, but they're still competing. So the question is, a lot of these I've just talked to you about, well, we can keep people competing, and is there anything to really worry about? You know, with the postromedial tibial stress reaction, odds are nobody's going to run down the field or down the track and break their leg. But there is the, the uh, anterior tibial stress injury. That's the high-risk stress fracture. So this typical 19-year-old female volleyball player, progressively worsening pain, the usual story. And here's her x-ray. 
and you can see at the anterior uh, tibial cortex, there's the dreaded black line. Now these are the ones that you worry about because it's like the Louisville basketball player that came down and snapped his tibia in the game and, and we've seen more than enough videos of, of stories like that. So this girl actually tried a relatively a long course of conservative treatment. Uh, no running, no impact loading. She even walked on crutches for a little while. Um, they tried a, uh, an injection into her periosteum to see if they could uh, stimulate some healing. Nothing worked. She was you know, basically against surgery. but. You know, the point is, this is the one that I worry about because when she's competing, this leg could break. Finally, she said, look, you got to get rid of this pain. Uh, with Dr. Sahabian, we put a rod down her tibia and uh, literally in a week, her pain was gone. Now she's training full go, has no trouble whatsoever, and as happy as could be. So the, the reason I point this out, that this is the stress fracture you have to worry about. Like, you can't just take a, you know, the approach that all these are just activity modification. You have to look for the, the one you know, one out of 30 patients is going to have the anterior tibial stress reaction, and that's the one that you have to be more aggressive with and, uh, and consider surgical treatment if they don't get better. So, you know, these are some of the things, again, that Eric talked about, so I'm not going to revisit all these things. Uh, but I do find that with these stress injuries, it's a good opportunity to really focus on general health and diet for these athletes who are working really hard. So in summary, it is a big problem. I think, uh, again, what I use as my go-to numbers are I, I like the pain score over six. The positive hop test is really important. Um, I, I ask about their history. If they've had any sudden changes, I'm most concerned. It, we deal with other stress injuries of the lower leg, but tibia is far and away the most common. Look at all the uh, external factors that may play into it. And again, like Eric pointed out, early identification is the key. If we catch this early, Get them on some early, you know, have it only be like a three-week or four-week treatment plan. They're probably going to stick with their sports. They're going to get better, and they're going to move on to a, a successful career. If we get them to the point where they're at a grade three or a grade four, and now they're looking at three or four months out of sports, that's where we lose our athletes. That's where they say, forget it. This isn't worth it anymore, and they, they just give up sports. So I think that's uh, a good message to send home. Thanks.